Hello, everyone. I am Jennifer Van Alstyne, and welcome to the first featured interview of 2022. Today, I'm here with Dr. Jane Coomber Sewell. Did I pronounce that correctly? Close. It's uh, Coombersoul. Coombersoul. Oh, yes. I like that even better. Dr. Jane Coombersoul. And we're going to be talking about how a website can change over time. Um, Dr. Jane Coombersoul created her website when she was in graduate school. And it's been a journey to figure out exactly what belongs on the website, if the website's going to work long term. And now some changes are being planned. They're ready to be made. And so I thought this is a great subject to share with you. Jane, it's great to talk with you today. Would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, so uh, I'm Jane. Um, in the uh, networking world in the UK, I'm now being referred to as Dr. Word Nerd. Um, <laughs> I run a business with my uh, wife, uh, which has two parallel streams, which is one of the reasons why the website is now Websites. Um, Joyce is an autism advocate and specialist. Uh, she's one of the few people in the UK who is qualified to mentor autistic people who is herself autistic. Um, while I work with word, we work both work with nerd, with words and nerds. Um, but um, so I am very much uh, moving from proofreading and editing and student support more and more into being a family and company historian and biographer because mm -hmm. companies have life cycles and stories to tell just as much as individuals do that's right and websites because they help us tell those stories to a wider number of people it needs to be changed and updated with time as our needs mm -hmm. change and as the things that we want to share with those people change as well mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i'm really glad that we're getting to talk today um can i ask what was your graduate background in what did you do your phd in so my my phd it comes under media and cultural studies um, but very broadly, it was um, uh, a four and a half year because um, I started off part time and then went full time um, adventure into the life of a lady called Joyce Grenfell, who is a British um, entertainer mm -hmm. and really considering her as a sociopolitical commentator, hence the history side of it, um, and a feminist. Uh, was she a feminist? The answer being probably only with a small f. Mm -hmm. um, but really looking at, at the power, uh, the power knowledge dynamics um, that she explores in all her in all her sketches, which she wrote herself. Um, so yeah, yeah, now I'm just trying to turn that into into a, a more a book that's for for, for normal people. <laughs> So you want to you want to write a book from that that is mm. for the general audience, it sounds like. Yeah, well, there's there's sort of two books at the moment. One is something that be be useful to to undergraduates, um, a sort of a different spin on on feminist moves. Feminism moves away a bit more from theory and into lived feminism. Uh, and then hopefully uh, something very much more for the for the general readership. Um, I am the only person currently. I'm the only person who's ever looked at Grenfell academically. Mm -hmm. There's been journalistic approaches and there's a very good um, biography by her goddaughter, who's also a journalist. Um, but that more general approach, I think, hasn't been done yet. Ooh, fascinating. Well, thanks for sharing that with me about your research. Uh, can I ask, is that something that shows up on your website? Um, it is. Um, what I said, so, so um, I suppose there's been three, well, two and a half versions of the website so far. Ooh, okay. um, so there was the one that we, we did, um, we, we launched sort of at the very beginning of my grad school days, which um, it was fine. And actually, when you look at my website or our websites, they don't look very much different different at all. The colours are, are the same. The logos haven't changed. We've updated the photos because you get fat, you get thin, you get fat, you get thin. Um, but um, they've become a lot more focused, I think. Mm -hmm. So this, the second version, which was launched about 18 months ago, was about giving us a lot more control our end. Um, okay. And it's, it's when I started blogging and I have a, 
a love love bit of hate relationship with blogging in that I would love to spend more time doing it and I think I could make it be work better than I am but um you you just keep rethinking how you blog all the time mm -hmm. and I think that's my big thing not just with the blogging but with websites is that it's not something static I think right. with our first one the, the major mistake we made was it was static oh. it didn't change it didn't have it didn't have a blog element and I maybe looked at it once every couple of years and I sent off a note to our web designer and she would charge me 15 pounds to change two words on a page the way it is or the way version 2.5 is is that all the actual text and layout I can control myself it's only when we want to do more technically advanced things like changing pictures and adding new drop downs and all those kinds of things that I have to contact my designer for so um, and that's the level I'm comfortable with Okay. Yeah. You like, you like being able to do some of those things. Yourself. Yeah. Can I ask, did you work way back for version one? Did you work with a designer on that version? Yes. Yes. And no. In the, um, I worked with a web designer who, um, accessibility was always important to us. Right. Um, I, I come from a disability services background. Um, so, um, that's what I did when I was a civil servant. Uh, for most of the time, I was a civil servant. I was a disability employment advisor. So I was always aware of making things accessible in terms of scaling font and it mm -hmm. still looking good. Um, so, and then we had a, a, a young designer do our logo for us. Um, and I love our logo. Um, would I change it? Probably not. I might tweak it a little bit, but mm -hmm. I don't think I'd actually change it. Mm -hmm. um, but all the text I've always written, partly because I'm quite, hmm, okay, yeah, let's be honest, arrogant about my use of the English language. Um, <laughs> That has its downsides, though, because, of course, um, SEO wise, I I dislike and I'm, I'm sure with you being quite creative, you you perhaps have the same conflicts about balancing got to get five five versions of the key word into the bots, pick it up <laughs> versus flow. I find that quite a tricky balance. Um, and getting all your meta tags right and all those things I find quite tricky so sometimes I will get a bit of help on that side of it nice well I'm going to interrupt you for a sec because for some of our listeners they may not know what SEO is so SEO stands for search engine optimization. It's something that people with websites do in order to um, help more visitors actually find their page. So there are specific keywords or phrases that you might go search for on Google. And if those phrases or keywords match up with the phrases or keywords on Jane's website, for instance, it will help you find her website. So Jane's saying that it's difficult to balance the number of keywords she puts into the copy she writes for her website website and actually writing it. And I think that's something that many people with websites struggle with. Um, if you're brand new to websites, this is your very first website, you might not be doing so much SEO work um, as Jane is, but you do want to have keywords like your name in there. So um, being able to put your name in your website is so important for helping people find it. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Appreciate and, you bringing that up. Uh, but I think there's also so something really important about keywords in that, um, often the keywords we end up having to use to get found and not words we're comfortable with. So my mm. wife's previous business was that she ran a telecoms billing platform and she wanted her website to say value. Okay. But people don't type into Google value. They type okay. in cheap. Ah. So she had to change. She'd done this whole page of value this and, value VoIP lines, value switchboard operations, value international calls. And she had to change all of them to cheap to get her SEO to work, which is not the image she wanted to portray, but it's what she needed to get people to then come and have that conversation with her. 
Yeah, I think um, with academics in particular, keywords might even be a little bit easier than that because mm. they're looking for a really specific audience. So mm. if your research is on a specific type of microbiology, for instance, mm. if you include that phrase in there, it's pretty likely to you know show up in Google. Mm. It's definitely harder when you're looking at a keyword that's as general as value or cheap because it's yeah. only one word. It can mm. make a really big difference in the types of visitors that you mm. get. So my recommendation for anyone listening is try to be really specific when you're thinking about the keywords um, that are going on your website. Remember, you're looking for a specific audience. Um, and in this case, you know, you may not be needing um, money that's tied to that. Maybe you're just looking for readers for your publication. So there's lots of options for keywords. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's true. And, and, and it's very industry specific. You really have to think through a strategy, which is why it's useful to, to use a designer sometimes. <laughs> um. Tell me more about what your old website was like. It sounds like you really didn't like that you couldn't do updates yourself, that you had to pay for updates. What else didn't you like about it? I, I, I think it was, um, it was, it was mainly the, the staticness of it. It was very mm. difficult and expensive to keep it current as, uh, you know, obviously when you start a business, it is, especially now, Absolutely. You can't start a business without a website. But in those first hmm, two years, I think, I mean, I think businesses are always evolving and changing. But in those first two years, um, that's probably when they move most. Mm. And therefore, if you've constantly got to be sending information to somebody else to tweak your content, um, I think it was also quite hmm, the layout was very current which meant of course it very quickly became very dated because uh -huh. um just like clothes just like hairstyles really not in a position to comment there's style and then there's fashion hmm. um it's a bit like um i can't because i don't do the 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 um the the graphic aspect of it i find it very difficult to pinpoint what that is but it's things like um, a Hermes scarf is always stylish. Um, a, you know, there are other things that are very fashionable for a very short period of time. And I think there are elements of website design, which I hope we're getting now, um, which is much more about a classic style. Hmm. While still being able to bolt on, so on on Joyce's site, she's got the live transcription so that she can um, vlog rather than blog, which connects in with the fact ah. that she's dyslexic. So it will, um, when she vlogs, it will transcribe it live. Speaking as somebody who does audio transcription, it's good. It's still not, not as good as, as me sitting there and doing it for her will ever be, but it's a lot quicker than me doing it Right, because um, right. it does so it live. Transcription um, is one of the ways in which your separate websites kind of re mm. revisioned the, the blog that you were, you were both working yes. on. So now so, you still blog and she I vlogs. Still, yes. Well, she's learning to vlog. Learning um, to vlog. <laughs> um, and it's, it's one of those things. And again, it's like, it's like the blogging. I always feel that I've got more to learn. And I could always do more of it. Um, and there is a great, as, as a writer, there is a great discipline in blogging because it keeps you, keeps you writing and it keeps the ideas flowing. Right. Often, I don't know about you, the ideas always come at the most inconvenient moment. You know, <laughs> when you're in the car, I can't really scribble an idea down. And then unless you have something like Otter on your phone so you can give yourself a quick note, um, the idea is gone. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have a lot of blog ideas. I, I just mm. keep a, I keep a list of them in my computer um, mm. and then I don't have time to write a lot of them. <laughs> no, well, that, well, that's it. I mean, that's, when, that's more my problem. <laughs> yeah. when, when we first relaunched the new one, we were religious. We, one of us mm. blogged every single Monday. Um, and, but we've been so busy. I've been so busy writing books. I haven't had the emotional energy i think to blog as well but i must That's you know interesting it, can it, you can you tell me a little more about that what do you mean by emotional energy to blog so 
there are lots of different approaches to blogging, aren't there? You can be your the intellectual expert or you can be a raconteur or you can be, because it's all about engaging with your particular audience. Mm-hmm. Well, because um, when I'm doing my, particularly when I'm doing the family biographies, people are telling me things. It's not supposed to be a therapeutic thing, but often it becomes therapeutic. Often people will will tell me things or tell us things, because Joyce does the interviewing and I do the writing, um, that are very personal and perhaps stuff they haven't talked about for years. Mm. So I want, our, my blogs to be quite open to um, and I often reflect on um, something that's happened during the week and if I have been very busy writing I haven't perhaps haven't had time to process that myself mm. I don't feel I can blog about it until there's a little bit of distance yeah. um, so I mean there was a blog I did I think the last blog I did or perhaps the one before that was about um the phrase self-care, I really struggle with the phrase self-care. I think being middle-aged and British, any, anything anything uh, foregrounded with self gets linked to, to words like selfish, mm-hmm. which is not how I feel about it, but it's kind of like a, a kick reaction. Right, right. And it took me ages to write that blog because I had to kind of balance it out. Mm-hmm. And I think if you blog from the heart which is what I try and do because I want our customers to know us because we feel very strongly that integrity is something that is impossible to attain but must be your strongest goal um sometimes those blogs take a lot of emotional energy yeah. I mean, when I used to when I used to copyright blogs for another company, um, you know, I, I, c- I can churn out 500 words on why a certain photocopier is the best on the market. <laughs> really, I can, I can do that probably in about half you know, an hour. But to write something, and the other thing I find quite time consuming when I'm blogging is is sourcing the illustrations because hmm. I always try and put in a couple of, of relevant illustrations. And I think it was was you or somebody in the same meeting we met at who told me about Unsplash. Yeah. Um, and that has made that a lot easier. But actually, again, we're back to keywords, finding the right keywords to get the image you want. It can be difficult. It's, it's, it's a constant learning thing, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's the biggest message is, it, is if you can always have an element of your website that you control even if it's not the techie stuff, because it's an absolutely live document. You yeah. will never finish your that's website. Right. That's right. That's that's what I teach all of my clients. That's um, mm. the process that I work through with them. Um, you know, we go through a really intensive planning process for their websites to mm. figure out what they actually need. Um, then we sit down and we create the copy for the website or they do it on their own. Um, once mm. that copy is placed, I actually teach them how to update pages on their website, how to add mm. new pages, how to navigate mm. the back end so that they can find what they're looking for. And they mm. get a recording of that so that they can do it themselves afterwards. I mm. actually don't do long-term management for websites, that kind of nickel and diming that you were talking about. Mm. You know, changing two words for for 15 pounds like I don't do that myself um, mm. I want to help as many people as possible that means that I can't manage websites long term mm. and I really need the academics that I work with to be mm. able to do some of that work themselves um, mm. so I think that that's really important having some of that control yourself sounds like mm. it's making a really big difference for you on your website mm. I also find it much easier to help Joyce so what we've done now is we've separated So I've retained uh, kumbasaw.co.uk and Joyce now has autism.kumbasaw.co.uk. And so we've done little things. So um, some of the pages mirror each other totally and others, uh, obviously her autism pages are a lot more detailed than mine. I still have a, a then then so my page is, is like a condensed version on autism, but it links to her website. And but, so silly things like I know for a fact that um, at the moment, because I'm I've spent more time on her website than mine, <laughs> um, her price li- uh, her price list for proofreading is much more up to date than the one on my website. But I'm the <laughs> one who does the proofreading. Um, so in fact, it was it, I've I've got a, a, a list of jobs to do at the weekend, and it was this 
knowing that I was going to talk to you that led to number six being update price list. (laughs) (laughs) So it's good to actually add it create a list like you're doing right now. Like Mm. what are the things that I need to change on my website? If you are approaching a website update project because you're watching this video, um, I do recommend make a list of all the things that you don't like about your website, all the things you do like about your Mm. website and all the things that you need to change. And then once you have that list, go ahead and schedule it in your agenda. Maybe you don't have time to accomplish all the things in your list right away, but Mm. if you space it out over time, you're going to get those updates made. You don't want to wait one or two years between updates on your website. Things get outdated more quickly than you think. And that, and that is very, very true. I also think it's good to have a, an honest friend, Hmm. a really honest friend. So, um, I had a, a very amusing phone call today, a video call, actually. Yeah. My, my, my longest term friend, we've known each other since I was five months old, wow. contact, uh, contacted me today on video call. And she's just about to uh, launch a, a professional photography website. Yeah. And uh, the one thing that she's not good is at, at is photos of herself. Right. But she went to put up her bo- and she said, Jane, choose between these two for me. And she showed me two. And I said, oh, dear God, it is the prime of Miss Jean Brody versus the famous five on crack. <laughs> um, and, uh, and whilst perhaps that was a little over blunt, it did help her choose the picture that she was going to choose hmm. and acknowledge the fact that it's only going to be a holding picture till she can get some new ones done. Yeah, that's, that's um, important. And having that, having that honesty and that rapport with you, it helped mm. her move forward in her, her thinking of it. Mm. And I think particularly on the visual side and on, but also on the tech side, because I mean, as a proofreader, there's, a, there's one rule that I have. It is proofreader, proofread thyself, because mm-hmm. it is almost impossible. And, and you know this, when you've written something and edited it and re-edited it, the the I mean you know I went I where I've been sort of trying to convert my my thesis into a book I am aghast at the mistakes that have slipped through as I've put it to bed for six months and then come back (laughs) to it really did I say that was I on said drugs at the time Um, and and you're a professional uh, like you're a proofreader right (laughs) it's the hardest thing in the world to proofread your own work that's so true Um, So having a trusted friend who is good at being straight, but also kind Mm -hmm. is, is really, really important. And, and I think, you know, in business, we get very hooked up on, should I be paying for this? Should I be paying for that? Mm. Or 99.9% of the time, I would say yes. Um, But occasionally it's okay, especially if it's just a quick check. To, to ask a friend for a favor because yeah. there's guarantee, guarantee there's a bit of skills barter that can go on. I think so. And I think, um, the way that I, the, the way that I explain it to my clients is that your friend, they love you and they care about mm. you. You know, they're yeah. actually going to be reading and examining your website with greater depth than your average visitor. They're going to stay on mm. it longer. They're going to read into it more, try to understand it more, um, so that they can talk with you about it. And that's more than your average website visitor is doing. If your friend mm. is telling you that something's confusing, that it's distracting, um, that it shouldn't mm. be there. Well, that's something that you should listen mm. to because other people aren't even going to give you as much time or attention as your yeah. friend is so it's worth listening to you know what they have to say you don't have to you don't have to respond to it you know you don't have to do it but getting that opinion is so helpful and I think I think also I mean we've we've talked about planning and 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 making sure we prioritize but I think there's also sometimes a a merit in striking while the iron's hot Mm -hmm. as well I mean a year ago you said to me Jane you need to make more of the fact that you're quote bilingual Mm. Do you remember this conversation? I do. I do. Um, it was it was a it was a comment about my proofreading the fact that I'm being um, of Canadian heritage that I can proofread in both um, Canadian and American English as well mm-hmm. as English English, and you said you need to make that much clearer on your website and you should blog about it. I still haven't done it because I <laughs> didn't do it in that moment, and if yeah. I had done, it would have been very 
much more impactful. I, I mm-hmm. think now if I am going to, to get, get around to it and I am going to blog on it, but I think it's back to that whole bit of, I don't think it, it will be as good a blog as if I'd done it within 24 hours. Oh, I don't know that that's the case. It's possible even that you're thinking about it for the last year is going to add even just one sentence to that blog that is emotionally in a better space now than it would have been then. So you never know that. I think it's totally, totally going to be awesome when you do it now. Interestingly, though, I have remembered to use the phrase when I've been talking to people. And I I think I've pretty much got every American PhD student at my university now sending me <laughs> their theses for proofreading. Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, I remember, I remember that conversation so well. And, and you were telling me about all the amazing things you were doing. And I was like, oh, I just read your website and it didn't say that. Like, that was mm. so awesome how you have a skill that really is going to help people uh, that are, that are English language speakers get mm. the proofreading that they need. Um, I also think that the the way that you go about updating your website to meet your needs is mm. so awesome like it sounds like version one and version two were both joint websites and now mm. version 2.5 is like separating that a little bit but it, mm. what it does is it gives you each more space so it's like your website is growing it's like your needs are growing your website's growing and mm. all of that copy all of the things that you know can be updated hey everything gets updated with time that makes sense <laughs> I think I think it also provides a lot of clarity in terms mm. of uh, we were trying to be all things to all people. And although we work together and our, our sides of the business complement each other, they're not the same. Right. Um, Joyce certainly couldn't do what I do. And I don't have the patience, I think, to do what she does. Um, and I certainly um, and I think by having the two websites at the moment, they're very similar. Um, or they will be when I've done all my updates. But I think over time, as she grows the vlogging side of it um, and, and teaching her how to edit, it's going to be hysterical because she's even more of a clog wearing Luddite than I am. Um, and as I continue to blog, um, I think it will give me the room. One of the other things I did based off the conversation you you had with me is that I changed um, one of the pages entirely. And you said to me earlier, I've just remembered this, you know, is your is your thesis on your on your website? Mm -hmm. Well, I took a sidebar and that now has every journal article, every um, every time I've contributed to a podcast. It's all on there. There's a publication sidebar. So you don't even have to go to a separate page for it. Ah. If you're interested in having me write a biography for you, you can get a sample of my writing by clicking on the sidebar, which just, it it was actually me being tight because I didn't want to pay to have another page created. <laughs> um, but it was but actually, it works works really well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, I love that. I love that innovation can can cause you to adapt. It sounds like you didn't want to pay for another page. So you needed to find another solution. And that creative solution ended up working out for you. And that, you know, that's what websites are all about. Experimenting to see what's going to work well for you long term. And if it doesn't, well, that's something that needs to be changed. And I think that adapting with your website, making room for it to grow it's not mm. going to happen all at once, right? No. You've had now 2.5 versions of this website mm. and you can still see it changing in the future. So mm. for anyone who's watching this interview, um, I, de- I definitely want to let you know that your website, it probably is going to grow or change over time. Even if you just have a simple one page website that has your bio and a photo on it, those elements are going to change. Your bio Mm. will be updated over time. Your photo, you're going to want to change that over time so that it looks Mm. like you. Um, Mm. I think that being open to that is such a great quality to have when you're building a website and when you're approaching a big update. So Joyce, or apologies, Jane, I just want to thank you so much for your candor in talking about how that website change has been for you. Now, before we wrap up, I do want to ask a little bit more about what it's like to work with someone since you worked with, it sounds like multiple designers on your website. Mm-hmm. Uh, two. Yeah. Two. So we had our, our, our original website designer. Um, there were some design elements that came from other people, but mm-hmm. 
as such, we had our original website designer and then we've got our current website designer. And I think there's something really important to say about our current website designer, not so much about his technical skills as a designer, although they're very strong. Mm -hmm. It's it's about personality matching, um, you know, particularly um, for for Joyce as an autistic person who is my wife's a little bit older than me 20 years um so she's her technical skills are very different from mine actually they they're they're great but she worries about them and so we needed a designer who who got how you talk to people who or how you talk talk to a to this person on the spectrum because Mm -hmm. actually once you've met one person on the spectrum you've met one person on the spectrum um and and he can and I'm not convinced I think a lot of the problems with our previous version is that I'm not convinced that our previous designer was quite on particularly Joyce's wavelength um and I think I think from that point of view I would encourage people if if you feel like somebody's talking a load of jargon and you're constantly running to catch up they're possibly not the right designer for you Ooh, that's so important so picking a designer is not just about budget it's not just about location or um you know what their portfolios it's also about how they get along with you and how well you can communicate with each other mm. i mean after all you and i i think we both know that you can go and buy a product you could go and buy a website product you know you you tend to use um, most of my Canadian and American friends tend to use Squarespace if they're building it from scratch. And over here, it'll be something like GoDaddy. But ultimately, if you're going to invest in that tailored service, people buy people. They don't buy a product, they buy people. So get to know your designer. Um, I am fortunate in that our designer is the partner of a friend of ours um, and he will come and train Joyce in exchange for a handmade pizza. Um, But, um, you know, from those from that point of view, it is worth spending the time, not just getting quotes, not just finding out what particular language they're skilled in um, or, you know, design they're skilled in you know, have a coffee with them if you can in these days of (laughs) masks and lurgy. Um, Take your time. It is a big, it might not be a big investment in in dollars or pounds, but it's a big investment in terms of your business's future or your future in terms of the academic reputation that you want. Um, So take your time. Yes, you can change later on, because we've been talking about keeping the websites updated right. constantly. But actually, if you're going to move that whole relationship to another designer, it is a bit of a hassle. You know, getting them to shift domain names from one host to another, it is a, it's, it's not a big job, but it is a, 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 a hassly job. So take your time picking your person. Ah, what wonderful advice. Uh, you know, meeting someone in advance can make a whole difference in how you understand them, seeing their facial mm. expressions, seeing how they respond to questions or mm. how they ask questions of you can make a big difference for people's comfort levels. So thank you mm. so much for sharing that with me. Now, speaking of academic reputation, you were telling me about a new article that you have out um, about your favorite lockdown read. Tell me a little bit more about that. <laughs> Oh, that was wonderful. And I, I think that, again, is, is something I've learned about academia this year, is I've, le- I've written or half written or even sent off some f- terribly intellectually worthy articles. Mm. And they tend to fall over. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm often always telling my students, don't overcomplicate things. Go with your first instinct, build on your first instinct. If, it's, if, if you have made the right choices, the, it will flow. And mm. I just happened to see this call for paper and I drafted out 
this article in about 40 minutes pretty quickly went straight so i have not it didn't even have a single edit on it um because it was passionate yeah. And um, so it's and I'm, I'm probably underselling my skills here because that's what I do. But so um, it's a, a piece in the South Central Review. Um, they did a lockdown special. I think they chose 25 articles in the end on um, they asked people to write on their favorite lockdown reread. Mm. And I chose a book by Sarah Paretsky. Um, to be honest, I could have chosen any book by Sarah Paretsky because I love them all. Um, and yeah, it's it's um, it was an it was a joy to write, and I think that that's what comes through in the in in the in in the reading of it. But I think my major message from it was about independent researchers, and and actually, I find Paretsky a very brave writer. And she's always gone with the flow and she's changed publishers when she's needed to. Um, and she's um, if she believes in something, she goes for it, even if people tell her not to. And I think um, to be an independent researcher, which is what I am and to an extent what you are, That's right. um, is is a brave place to be. And I think um, academia needs to take us a little bit more seriously. Mm, that's um, also right. Because actually, for us to stick our necks out with no institution backing us, with no access to other funding, you know, there used to be this attitude, and I think there still is this attitude, that if you're not sponsored, you can't be any good. But actually, I think it's the other way around. I think if if you survive um, without an institution backing you or without a, 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 a certainly a, a permanent post you are um apologies um that's my my emails going off um <laughs> um you are brave you're actually you're showing your metal i was self-funded through my phd and actually to you don't you don't set out to spend twenty five thousand pounds plus unless you're sure you can produce the goods or at least you're brave enough to find out. <laughs> and I think, I think that was my big message in this article is you've really, you know, academic world, you've really got to start, stop underestimating and putting barriers in the way of us independent researchers. You know, I'm doing a piece of research next week, which I feel rushed on because it's the last piece I was able to get ethical approval on ah. before I finished my PhD. And now as an independent researcher, unless I can find it. Um, I mean, I, I have more options in the arts than my wife does in the sciences, mm. um, because there are uh, publications who will um, take me without being without ethical approval, as long as I've gone through my own kind of ethical quality assurance. But stop putting barriers in the way of us independence, because we've got plenty to say. And we because we're independent, sometimes we can do things that you can't. I think that um, academia does need to listen up to independent researchers and, and where they're at because so many PhD students that are graduating these days will end up as independent researchers mm. in some way or another. There are mm. not enough teaching positions to go around at the university level. Um, and Absolutely. the adjunctification of the, of the university has is prolific it's and it's mm. not changing it's not going to go down mm. um i mean i hope it does but that's yeah. not what the trends are saying um so we do need to have more conversations like this we do need mm. to talk about things like open access and journals accepting independent researchers mm. and um appreciating uh, the contributions that they make unfunded frankly mm. um so i'm so glad that this kind of lockdown reread inspired you to just kind of jump into a new article and and get it out into the world um which book did you choose by the way i chose guardian angel guardian um, angel um and i but I, as i say i could have chosen any of the grandfather mm -hmm. ones um there was another one i didn't choose um because it's i realized cause the specific remit was what's your favorite reread and I could have chosen one of the others but I realized it was my favorite purely because I'd won a copy in a competition <laughs> and bless her Sarah Paretsky had posted it to me herself and been daft enough bless her sorry Sarah 
to leave her home address on the envelope. Uh. <laughs> um, which I promise you faithfully, Sarah, I'm not going to come and stalk you. <laughs> but I do still have the envelope and it is very carefully preserved. Oh, that's sweet. It meant a lot to you. And that's why you felt so so strongly mm. about the book. Well, the people who ran the organ or the, the competition for that book are like, yes, our competition really inspired someone to love this book. And so that's I really I hope that's wonderful. So. Yes. <laughs> I really hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Jane, thank you so much for our conversation today. I have really loved talking with you about your website and how it's changed throughout the years. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up? Um, no, I, I think I would just just underline your website is never finished and that's okay. I love it. I love it. How can people get in touch with you uh, who um, are listening to this interview? Okay, so the easiest way is to um, email me on info at coombasool.co.uk or jane at coombasool.co.uk. Um, but I'm very lucky, of course, with a surname like mine. We literally are the only two in the world. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you can remember my surname, you're going to be fine on those keyword searches. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Jane, uh, we will see you again in 2022. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Lovely. Thank you for inviting me. You take good care.